see any of you. I don't know what profiles or backgrounds you come from. So I uh, request you to bear with me for a bit and I will try and make this as uh, relevant as possible. So what I have tried to do really today is to think around the idea at larger macro levels and take these concepts of language teaching, research and education as three chunks and link them together in some kind of a dialogue. Uh, it's also a more of a reflective session that will try and think through certain philosophies, concepts of language, concepts of literacy and concepts of what research can be for ourselves and to research a field in itself and then see how it can be adapted to a variety of contexts. So uh, before uh, I basically sort of try to structure my uh, discussion around three chunks. So in the first chunk, I will deep dive into the idea of language teaching itself. Think about what we already know about language teaching and maybe introduce uh, the idea of literacy as the education component of language, language teaching. It's a concept that possibly many of us are already aware of, but it's always worthwhile visiting and revisiting it before we move into things like pedagogy and research, which I believe as a practitioner and as a researcher to be rooted, to necessarily have to be rooted in some epistemic and philosophical grounding for it to be meaningful. Uh, in the next chunk, I thought I could maybe look at some strategies that works for me as both a researcher and as a teacher, as someone who teaches literature, as someone who teaches language and the kinds of research methods, codes, practices that have helped me to reflect more on not just my practice as a teacher, but also to understand the field better. So it will really not be, a, it, these are cherry picked concepts from research that we can apply both as academicians and as practitioners. And uh, I will end the session with a brief case study, a case study or rather a story of a research, a large scale research that I was involved in at this a few years ago which hopefully should illustrate some of what we have been talking about in the earlier sessions. So maybe I can start. Uh, I'll share my screen. Please give me a minute. Um, is my screen visible? No, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible, but uh, I'm afraid it's, nothing is visible. Yeah, am I audible? Can someone confirm? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Oh. All right. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so now your yes. screen is visible, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. So very briefly, this idea of language teaching is not new. The idea of research is also not new. And the idea of education, of course, is where the two weave together. Uh, but one uh, important aspect that we always think about when we are thinking of teachers as for professional development and as for effective and meaningful teaching is when we are becoming reflective practitioners. So the question is, how do we actually enable that to happen? Um, in other circumstances, I would have liked this to have been a co-constructed activity, but right now I will leave the slide on for a moment. I would like you to look at these questions. Language education must, should and could. So what I would like you to do is if you have a piece of paper somewhere, you could make three columns, a must, should and could column. In the first column, list down those elements of language that you feel must be taught in a language classroom. So the first column is a non-negotiable category. What are all those things that you think are absolutely essential for language classroom to have? The should is a desirable column, which is this is it is good if we can include these aspects within the language classroom. And the third column on should can be the dispensable ones. It would be good. It can be taught, but you're not really going to miss anything if you don't teach it. 
uh, maybe you can take about two minutes and make this little bucket list and we can revisit this towards the end. So to repeat, the first column must is the column that should contain your list of all the activities or all the elements that you feel are absolutely essential and indispensable in a language classroom that should be taught in language classrooms. The should are the desirables, the middle column. So it is good if they are there, it will enhance the experience, it will make students better communicators, and it should definitely move into the must column. The could are the additionals that you feel can be dispensed with if required, and I mean, it's okay if it's not there. No one will really suffer if it's not part of it. So you can make this list and uh, reflect also as you're making it why you want these elements included in the must, the should, and the could. So this is really more like a reflective journaling in a way. So when I first tried an exercise of this kind myself, I realized that a lot of my ideas for what must, should, and could be taught are really coming from my own experience. The fact that I've been in an education system for more than 30 years, which is pretty much all of us, we've gone through schools, we've gone through colleges, and now we are all on the other side of the table teaching students. And we form certain ideas about what is ideal, what is the best way of teaching, and how students would learn the best. And these are valid. These are absolutely valid principles and beliefs to go on because we are, in a way, products of these ideas ourselves. But what also helps is when we start listening and discussing what others have gone through and what other experiences are, and we realize that actually schools are different. Curricula are different. Methods of transacting it are different. Teacher personalities are different. There are so many variables that impinge on how language or any theme that gets taught is that it's surprising when we see the must, should, and coulds varying. What uh, would be interesting to see then is the a macro level perspective of what a language classroom entails, particularly today in the age of globalization when we have a lot of technology, when there is interconnectivity, when we are exposed to media in different forms, the nature, the number of languages, the kinds of artifacts that we come, that we encounter in our environment, the times, types of modes in which we encounter it. We listen to music, we listen to podcasts, we see films, sometimes we see silent films, and we are still engaging with some kind of a logic behind the performance of those silent films to make meaning. More importantly, we are looking at interdisciplinarity. We are looking at multidisciplinary connections. We are looking at transdisciplinarity. The education policy, the current education policy, which is underway, and that is asking for people to make these kinds of conceptual and cognitive um, leaps in bringing those changes about within the classroom is also talking about cross connections of looking at language across curriculum, of looking at subjects talking to each other. And in each of this, language becomes a core component. Language becomes a component not just because we are speaking in English or Hindi or Marathi or Gujarati or whatever language it is. It's also because we're thinking in that language. We come with a certain cognitive structure, with a certain oral tradition that frames the way we perceive the world. And that actually leads us to these intercultural competences that are so important today. Because the language is not just about being able to transact a foreign language, get the grammar right, buy a cup of coffee without embarrassing ourselves, but really about sensitivity, about being able to understand another person's point of view, of being able to recognize and realize this nuance within articulations and speeches. And all of these get transacted in very, very discreet ways in almost every work we do. 
in every engagement, physical or virtual with people around us. If we are to look at the current age of globalization, then then what is the landscape of the language classroom and what is the characteristic that is added to the act of teaching a language? Um, if we are going to be then saying that we are teaching language in increasingly diverse circumstances, in increasingly innovative ways, with a lot of media, with a lot of ICT used, we are also we also have the possibility of connecting across the globes at the click of a button. Then what should language education be? Language education should definitely support the ability to read, write, listen and speak the four basic skills. But then what does reading, writing, listening and speaking mean? There is at the one level the idea of basic decoding of a script. So when we are looking at reading, writing, listening and speaking, we are looking at alphabets, Akshar Gyan, able to understand that this little inverted triangle with a dash in the middle is an A and a B and so on, to stringing words together to form sentences, to paragraphs and making sense of the paragraphs. And that brings us to this larger concept of meaning making. Meaning making, which is seen in a particular sense as a certain actualization of one's own thoughts, of one's personalities, of one's ideas, of responding to the environment, of responding to the environment in meaningful ways, thinking critically, being creative, all of which are in fact qualities that we want ourselves and our students to possess at the end of any program. The question is, what then are we doing and how do we go about doing it? And we also know from literature that there are actually no single ways in which it can happen. There are multiple options of enabling that to happen. We can use multiple ways of using different kinds of texts. I can use a movie. I can use, a, I don't know, rap music, perhaps. I can use different kinds of artifacts to, to get that going. But then how do I design my pedagogies? How do I design my assessments? How do I know whether the student is really learning or not? What does learning really mean? These become certain very fundamental questions that the field of literacy studies engages with. And uh, when we look at the field of literacy studies, there has been a tremendous movement in the last 50 to 60 years. And this really comes from a more Hogar movement away from the Hogarthian form of literacy, which was about training and getting people ready for the workforce to a form of literacy today that is so fluid that requires people to be prepared for a workforce in in a way when we don't even know what the future of work is going to be. And uh, they talk about the current literacies from the new literacy studies to the work of new London group, which is working in the areas of multi literacies and critical literacies, identifies three broad ways of understanding the way language functions and what language teaching should entail. So they look at this concept of operational literacy and uh, other words that are associated with operational literacies are functional literacies or basal literacies, basically meaning the ability to maybe sign or to recognize an alphabet, to write their names, to read a few sentences. So a more mechanical form of understanding a language so that you can be a quote unquote functional member of society. So if I go at, go to a bank, I should be in a position to withdraw the money that I want without committing a fraud inadvertently. If I'm a bank operator, I should be able to read what it is that the uh, the the customer wants and help them in a particular way. If I'm working in, say, a bus, I should be able to read the notes given to me and issue the right amount of ticket to the passengers and so on. So this kind of a literacy is seen as a way that will enable people to operate and keep society functioning. Building on these, on the other hand, are the critical and the cultural literacy practices that start and move with the operational literacy as the foundational ones. But from there, they move into a more critical space of identity, of well-being, of cultural sensitivity, of understanding social systems and structures, of recognizing, for instance, that a woman wearing a of, of a woman wearing a particular form of a cloth or a dress is a married woman or not, in which culture. It is a larger holistic understanding of life that cultural and critical literacies deal with.
And critical literacy takes the concept of cultural literacy a little further when it looks at the act of reading, writing, listening, and speaking as acts of power. So it recognizes that I am here, I'm engaging with this other who is out there, and there is a power relationship between them. It uses the word discourse in that sense and talks about how discourses construct our own knowledge of the world. So everything from the hidden curriculum, the formulation of syllabus to transaction of certain kinds of pedagogies are all geared towards the self becoming an operational being with the other within social context and political context. But it's also something that enables a certain form of engagement with the world that is more interpretative. So it is not a mere replication or a mere rote learning method, but that requires agency. What James Britton would call agentivity to be able to promote the ability to construct new knowledge. Uh, this is something that UNESCO, in fact, recognized and has been recognizing for several years now and has been talking about it as a need for the sustainable development goals to happen. And I just pick out this one quote because it's an interesting way of formulating the role of the language classroom in a world that is changing and in what they call the future of education because this is something that we don't have any idea about. We don't know what work is going to look like Forget 20 years, three years from now, we have no idea what work will be. We will have no idea what kinds of skills the future generation will need to be functional members of retaining a global uh, sustainable globe in that way. And this is reflected when UNESCO says the world is changing. And since the world is changing, education also needs to change. It's also important to note that there is a cyclic dialogic relationship between the world and education. We don't change education only because the world is changing, but a change in education can also change the world. And that as assumes a certain responsibility on what we do within our classrooms, on what we do within the space of educational institutions to ensure that the world we create are more equitable, are more just, are more inclusive, and most importantly, respect the individual. They respect the creativity of the individual, the uniqueness of individualities. And this means, like they say, we need to move beyond literacy and numeracy, not just as decoding principles or understanding basic concepts or ideas, but really as spaces of constructing new knowledge, of respecting other people, of enabling equal dignity, and as, as well as the environmental uh, dimensions of sustainable development. So we are looking at global citizenship. We are looking at peace. We are looking at racial uh, discrimination coming down, gender equality going up. All of this needs to become part of almost every classroom, language classrooms included. So if we then go back, take a step back and look at what this vision of a new world order and a new equitable society means for language teaching, um, a few ideas that I've pulled out from different people. There are, in fact, a lot of um, uh, theorists who have written and speculated on how literacy and language classroom can enable this to happen. Uh, for in the interest of time, I'm picking out a few here. And uh, Hirsch is one person. E.D. Hirsch was one person who built largely on this idea of cultural literacy. And his model is a little is quite interesting because when he says cultural literacy, he's not specifically talking about cultural studies as in studying social systems, but about trying to look at words and the relationship between vocabulary development and cultural beliefs. Similarly, he talks about how these different ways of building knowledge about social structures, building knowledge about human experiences is related to the language that we use. And for this kind of rich vocabulary to develop, one needs to also develop a certain sensitivity in the learner. So the mere development of a series of the thousand best words in English or the 50 best, most frequently used words in French is not going to give you a cultural perspective to the language. What will give a cultural perspective is to think through about how these vocabularies relate to human experience. Um, Paulo Freire, in this regard, had a very interesting experiment that he did in uh, uh, in his 
locality and he so he he you got created these little cultural circles and what he did with the culture circles was he got the working class together and he said we are going to now learn language and we are going to teach you the language of the state but before we teach you the language of the state let's understand your life a little more and there was a deep ethnographic study that was done where he went in and spoke to them and he realized that there were a set of words that they use very frequently so if the community for instance is a uh, It's, it's a farming community and it deals in potatoes he realized it well they're using potatoes quite a lot so let us first start by teaching them the words and the association of the words for that word potato in the target language and then they moved outward so there was a certain investment for the for the target audience itself in learning that and realizing that there is another word for it in another language and we can use it in our own way those kinds of agencies are built into these kinds of reading liter uh, literacies and re deep reading practices which also then moves into critical analysis so this is where we move from not just developing a basic vocabulary but also into developing critical thinking skills into reflecting on what the words can mean within the context of their utterances so in uh, based on that uh, experience of the reading circles freire talks about how reading the word preceded reading the word and the subsequent reading of the word cannot dispense with continually reading the word there is a beautiful cyclicity again in the way language and human experience relates to each other a recognition that knowledge of words comes from hearing from the environment from the kinds of uh, interactions that humans have with the world around them and that in turn in a way frames that cognitive model so when jerome bruner is talking about the narrative as that mentalist structure through which we make meaning of world this is how it works it works because we are narrativizing our experience we already are looking for rubrics to make sense of some occurrence that has happened to us so slowly what uh, the literacies and the critical literacy and the new literacy studies is doing is really broadening the base of language to look at it as meaning making structures where words and sentences and experience engage in dialogic ways and it enables learning to happen in a more holistic way to enable agentivity to enable that creativity to occur similarly said's own work about the situatedness of consciousness of writing of interpretation of reflection all of this makes it a an act that requires deeper thought and that is a layered act which leads us to this next larger level of what language is how it a message exists within a social environment so when i speak i am influenced by my environment at the same time i am constructing and changing my environment in its own ways so this message is about something outside but it is also constructing my own view and it happens in a variety of media it happens through films it happens through poetry it happens through artifacts drama music stories every form of in fact and now it it happens through memes it happens through twitter tweets you can look at multiple forms in which these messages are conveyed through the text through language and through discourse to construct those discourses what we then look back to is that our language teaching practices need to to factor these different elements in to factor the variety and the range of the scope that language education is now taking because of the world we live in today and this is in fact something that a lot of critical liter uh, new literacies and critical literacy the new london group critics talk about particularly mary uh, mary calances and bill cope uh, they in fact say that our original understanding of literacy is moving from the oral to the print and deciphering but no it's much more than that it was that is how it was initially but the last 10 to 15 years has completely changed the landscape of what literacy can do and what it should be doing because messages come in diverse forms and there needs to be a certain ability within readers and writers and creators of content to engage with these messages so for example if we are to take a tweet of a 
a little meme or a cartoon or a comic, whatever it is that you would like to call of this kind. What sense do we make of it? We see that it is on Facebook. It uh, is obviously on popular media. So people around the world have access to it. Now, if they want to make sense of what this cartoon is saying, what are the abilities that they need to have? They need to be able to first see. They need to be able to read expressions. So they need to be able to understand that there is some kind of a tension happening within this picture that has been given. There's a man sitting there who's quite happy with himself, a woman in the foreground frying pakoras or whatever it is, and talking on the phone, looking a little actually quite irritated. And uh, she says he's not helping at all. He just claps for me for full five minutes every day. And it's a perfectly, perfectly normal kind of a situation where there is a certain irritability and you're like, you know, whatever, that's all he does. He just claps for me and, and appreciates the fact that I make him, but he doesn't help me at all. If we look a little closer, we see that the man is watching a movie, uh, watching a what could be a television which has lockdown diaries on it. Someone, anyone who has been in India and who has experienced a pandemic in the last two years will know what the lockdown means. And any, any human species should know it by now. And then when we put it within the context of clapping for me for five minutes, it starts taking on a slightly different note. Yes, of course, you also need to be able to understand the English alphabets to read the quote, which says, no, he is not helping at all. He just claps for me for full five minutes every day. So I need to know what five means as a number and a quantity it means and how to string words, alphabets together to make sense of that. But now we come down to lockdown and we start thinking, OK, this is probably an overburdened woman and quite upset about that. Maybe no one is cooking for her. Suppose we think a little more about when this particular comic was published. The timeline says 27th March. For someone who is an Indian, the date will be a significant one. So now you need to know that 27th March has a certain significance because it was on 22nd March that the first Janta lockdown happened as an experiment because we are trying to cut it, cut down the spread of the pandemic. And this was a way to see whether people can stay at home for some amount of time. This is also the time where there has been a tremendous pressure on the frontline workers and the doctors and the health system. And there is a need to keep that morale and the the morale going so that we realize and recognize the work that is being done. So we actually stood out uh, in the uh, in our balconies on 22nd at around 5 p.m. and clapped for them. When we see this in the context of that historical context of having lived through that Bartan banging and lighting a candle scenario, the comic takes on a very different kind of an implication, apart from just being a comic of maybe a joke. It, it is kind of funny if you don't know the background to all of it. But when you start recognizing the backgrounds to where the comic comes from, the timelines, the implications are quite huge. Similarly, the uh, this little article that came on 29th March, it is not an accident that there have been lots and lots of articles about women being overburdened during the lockdown, especially the initial stages. Research being done about the domestic workforce and the inequality of labor within the house at the workplace. Messages of this kind are actually not just giving scanning artifacts. Activities around these need to go beyond just students being taught the meaning of overwhelmed or how or fi finding out a synonym for sturdy. There is a certain relationship that a comic strip with barely 20 words has on a larger socio cultural civilizational experience that we have gone through in the last two years and that we are still going through. It's not been resolved. That is a kind of cultural literacies. That is the kind of critical literacies that all these literacy critics envision as taking place within the classroom. So it is not just 
the operational because the operational will enable you and yes it is the foundation to this critical and cultural because without the operational you're not even going to get past the second stage of figuring out that there is a lockdown diary but once you've done the operational we don't stop there we also move into the critical and we also move into the cultural and we look at the world in a more holistic way which in a way informs how we transact the teaching of learning in languages within a classroom in not just single language departments but across departments in liberal arts programs and economics programs and master's courses in school education in a variety of ways so there is this idea that language is all pervasive because you do need it to move beyond and to acquire knowledge of other disciplines but what is also important to not forget to keep in mind is that language is that meaning making structure that exists in the human brain and helps us become functional just members of society to know when to laugh and when to empathize and what to do after we finish laughing these are the different ways in which the new literacies envisions its work and envisions the practice of language teaching so if we have to map it to the anderson taxonomy of remembering understanding to creating the new literacy studies would see the objectives of the language classroom for learners and educators as involving in for instance material selection so when i am selecting teaching learning materials when i'm selecting multimedia content to take into my classroom what should i be keeping in mind a denser layered material will have more scope for creating a lot of activities within the classroom than maybe a straightforward text that merely says come meet me at 5 in the evening so at the level of materials selection at the material of social at the level of social practice how and how do i interpret cultures how do i interpret critical relationships between the writer and the reader how do i interpret responses to certain forms of messages literacy is associated with space who speaks why do they speak what are the kinds of enabling factors that let them speak in that sense and then the most important form of multimodal literacies multimodal literacies is basically the ability to transact and to create opportunities to use language in different modes and different forms and this is really an important element to factor in that the new literacy studies keep stressing from the perspective of inclusivity from the perspective of recognizing that actually in the age of globalization and technology we have people speaking millions of languages whom we are connected to at a click of a finger and if we are talking about multilingual and bilingual approaches our transactions and our opportunities that we create within the classroom needs to enable those sorts of interactions also to happen multimedia of course is the most obvious form of literacy and digital literacies that we need to develop because we are looking at people working in the language space across uh, across different forms of media there's a, what's called transmedial storytelling for instance where the narrative principles of plot characterization points of view find their way in genres as uh, wide as script writing to films to writing stories to even creating content for a regular classroom so the literacy and the oracy element of integrating reading writing listening speaking skills to give a more holistic sense of how to engage with language teaching and language learning and finally literacy as critical consciousness this was really the core of paul freire's philosophy which has actually informed a large part of philosophies that have uh, that uh, came post the 1960s 70s when he was doing his work the fact that reading writing listening and speaking are fundamentally acts of interpretation we are making sense of the world and we are interpreting our experiences and for when we start interpreting it we will automatically develop a critical attitude to our environment to ourselves and to our own thoughts what we will hopefully also uh, enable at that point with the use of dialogue is a certain tolerance 
So I don't shut someone else out. I recognize that they have a point to make and then I learn to grow with them. So Freire's point, in fact, in a large part of his um, pedagogies and his works like the pedagogy of the oppressed and education for critical consciousness is that the teacher is not someone who's pouring knowledge into learners, but is co-learning with the students. So there is a certain humility. There's a lot of love and dialogue that happens. And every time we keep that dialogue alive, there is a greater, richer scope of that kind of learning to enable critical consciousness. Now, these ideas have actually resulted in a variety of discourses and a variety of, of um, perspectives that have come out of the literacy studies. One particular perspective that I would like to just mention and look at is by uh, Cope and Kalansis, who founded the New London Group. And uh, they have a huge group of people they work with, and they have been working in this area for nearly 30, 40 years now. They, were, uh, they are based in the University of Illinois. And this is something you can also look up online because they have tremendous amount of materials and uh, online videos about what they talk about here. So very briefly, to give an overview of their work, Cope and Kalansis believe that literacy is has those fundamental works to things to do in the classroom. So when they go into a classroom, we do need to teach and prepare students for the workforce. We do need to teach them how to read and write so they can be functional members and keep society going. But they also say that there are these intangible absolute necessities that a language classroom needs and literacy practices need to inculcate practices of citizenship education, practices of identity, practices of cultural sensitization, being able to navigate new media. Because for them, these are as important, in fact, more important than just being a functional social worker or someone who's, who's keeping, who's doing their job properly. Because these are what will promote those earlier aims that UNESCO is talking about as a just order, social justice, of building a national vision, and the tensions that come with these. How do we coexist? How do we ensure that our interests are balanced with our rights and duties? And based on this, they came up with this learning by design module where model, where they look at how experiencing, applying, conceptualizing, and analyzing are the four quadrants along which activities are designed. So the, so that at one level, it is not just entirely autonomous learning. There is a certain guided learning of language activities that happen within the classrooms. And from the guided learning of experiencing the meaning, the students go on to apply it, to think creatively, to analyze, to reflect on what they have learned. So if I'm teaching them a principle of, say, a vocabulary or the EI principle, E before the I, except in uh, XYZ cases, they need to give we they need to be given a set of words that um, uh, that illustrate this principle then they probably go and apply it when they are writing it themselves and then they go back and reflect what it is that they have done maybe come up with their own formulae of some, some kind and theorize on these abstractions so a large part of their learning by design really was like go from experience to abstraction rather than give them the formula and come back to the um to the basic applications and uh, in this context they demarcated between these two kinds of pedagogies the didactic and the authentic so in the, the didactic pedagogy they spoke about how a large part of this didacticism is about memory reasoning the lower order skills of the bloom's taxonomy and how uh, knowledge is seen as imitation and uh, the teacher is the authority who knows everything and in the process of knowing everything, they transmit the knowledge rather than co-construct knowledge with their learners. And this also sort of homogenizes teacher and student identities. This is an important point to note because we keep thinking of just students as diverse. Teachers are also diverse. Teachers have different styles. Teachers have different ideas. As educators, each of us has a belief and a vision of our own. And there is a creative element in every one of the educators just as there is a creative element in every one of students. So when you have like a ready-made lesson plan handed out to you without a scope for 
trying to figure out if you can do it a little differently, it is doing disservice to both communities. And these are certain aspects that the didactic pedagogy sort of does not take into account. It says that there is a homogenous curriculum and you're doing like an IRE process of initiation, response and evaluation. So teacher asks a question, students give the answers and finally she says yes, good or no, bad. And uh, for Cope and Kalansis, they sort of um, uh, link this back to the Fordist era where the first with industrialization when factories started coming into the picture, people, uh, we needed factory workers to go in there and run the machine. So the basic point was really about classroom spaces that faced forward. There was direct instructions given. There was rote learning. There was a lot of audio lingual methods of repeating what was heard so that when they go into a factory, they don't get their hands ripped off or they follow the instructions. They know where they have to put what and you have your mass production happening at a stage where you can make a lot of money. And the imperialist agenda was sort of promoted through that didactic process. For them, however, today's world is not the Fordist world. We now live in an age where robots can do that work. We are not looking at little boxes made of tiki taki in which we put and have like a very common kind of an experience. The world we live in now requires an authentic pedagogy that actualizes human experience, that is facilitating critical thinking, that is facilitating creativity, both at the way, as, as a way of thinking of new ways of doing the same old thing, or maybe think of new things to do, to ensuring that there is equitability. The politics and race and ethnicity and gender and sexuality do not become limiting factors. And for that, we need a different way of looking at education and at language education itself. Um, one of the reasons why I'm sort of going into these details is because a lot of teaching practices and a lot of assessment practices, a lot of curation of materials, as well as something as simple as organizing our classes are informed subconsciously by these ideas. What we need to do is to bring them to the front of our consciousness. We need to evaluate, for instance, which of these 12 prompts is didactic and which of it is authentic. If I ask a student, copy the meaning of the following words into your notebook, am I, what is the kind of ability that I am inculcating in them? If I'm telling them, fill in the blanks with the correct tenses, adjectives, pronouns, adverbs, whatever it is, what am I doing? I'm giving them a sentence, it's a blank. And so a lot of these are the kinds of prompts that we have experienced and that we continue to give our students. Uh, I will also say somewhere that um, this is not to say that there is a right way or a wrong way. This is to say that there are multiple ways. The situation, on the other hand, needs to deter, needs to be the one that will help us determine which to use. So it will be necessary at some point for us to teach directly and to teach children what word meanings mean because they will not be able to construct new knowledge. And so if I'm not taught the alphabets of Russian, if I'm not taught the meaning of Russian words, I'm not going to be able to write my own story. So it is not a matter of prioritizing one over the other, but being strategic what Kumara Vadivel talks about in his post methods of macro strategies and these strategic choices we make depending on the contexts of the users, depending on the context of the learners, our own abilities, availability of resources. So you do have a range of prompts here which look at different aspects and these kind of come with a combination of enabling a certain freedom to students, to enabling too much of thinking and so on. The strategizing is what really makes the difference. Um, I think I will stop here for a couple of minutes. And uh, if there are any questions, maybe we can take those before I move to the next segment. Will that be OK? Absolutely fine, ma'am. Yeah. I think it will also be time for Yes. So if there are any questions on the chat, I'll be happy to take that up. I've not been able to cover everything right now. It's a, it's a vast field, but yeah, yeah, we can have a short discussion now if needed. Yeah, ma'am, we will facilitate it for you. Uh, you. I would ask, Jui, are you there? Jui, ma'am? Jui and Prajesh and all can mitigate it for ma'am. 
please uh, help ma'am to handle these questions. Are you all there? Juhi? Juhi ma'am, are you there? Yeah, uh, uh, this is Shashank here. Uh, so, uh, yes. those who have questions for uh, for the speaker here can can post their questions in the chat box. In case it's not accessible to you, you can uh, raise your hand. I will uh, allow you to unmute yourself, and you can then uh, yeah, orally ask. So, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, Yes, uh, so there is a question from uh, Farida Khan. Uh, Ma'am, uh, who would decide what's uh, didactic or authentic? Authentic. Authentic. Yeah. Who, who would, would decide? Who would decide yes. what is didactic or and what is authentic? Okay, so uh, didactic and authentic are really ways of finding out how the questions uh, go. So didactic. One way of looking at it is to think of how the responses come. In a didactic pedagogy, I'm not really giving my students a chance to think on their own. So if I say something like the, the meaning of good is to be nice. A statement of this kind is when I'm going into the class and I'm giving them knowledge. This is the gyan, samaj lo, and that's about it. But suppose I go in there and ask, uh, do you know what good is? There may be silence. Maybe I give them a prompt. Can you think of the opposite of good? Have you heard this word before? What context have you heard it in? And I'm allowing students to come up with responses of their own and using those responses to maybe tell them, guide them. Suppose they say good is fine. And I may say, well, you know, fine is OK. Do you want to push that idea a little further? What do you mean by fine? And then you are sort of guiding them to think about it in a particular way so that they arrive with the answer, the deductive versus the inductive things, a way of looking at language. Those would, uh, the pedagogical practices that will enable the student to start thinking about a word by themselves or about a problem by themselves would be an authentic pedagogy. Because what will then happen is that they will also probably bring their own context into the classroom. Four different children, we have four very different experiences of what good and bad means. But that is their life experience. And we are allowing that space in the classroom for them to think about their life experience. Maybe they've got it completely wrong. Maybe they are using a wrong experience to associate with the word good. And perhaps that is where the teacher's intervention comes in to make that distinction. So a didact, uh, so an authentic pedagogy would be when the teacher is a mentor. The teacher is teaching. It should not be um, misread to think that there is no learning or teaching happening. The teacher does remain to some extent a guide in that learning process, but there is a greater freedom for students to explore ideas and to come up with ideas rather than just being merely told this is it. So that uh, I, I'm not sure if I've answered your uh, query. It, it can happen at the level of pedagogy. It can happen at the level of prompts. It can happen at the level of designing your classroom activities to enable a greater um, opening up of students and the learners. And it's actually interesting because uh, when you do an authentic pedagogy and, and you allow learners to come up with their own ideas, the teachers also grow with them. You can never predict what comes to you. And it's a huge learning experience that way. Um, OK. Rajesh, sir, you, you are facilitating it for ma'am. OK, ma'am, there is a question from Shehnaz, oh. Madam Shehnaz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Juhi, you're there? Uh, ma'am, you can go ahead. I'll take up the next one. OK. So Madam Shehnaz asked that, uh, would you say that didactic pedagogy is a teacher centric as it has been traditionally done? Yes. The question is, is. yes. It is. Uh, in fact, a lot of these people use these um, terms 
they, they have coined a lot of new terms within literacies, but ELT already has quite a lot of it in it. So they are not saying anything new as much as trying to frame it in a way that enables us to think through ways of doing it in uh, making it a more uh, inclusive classroom. So you're absolutely right. A didactic pedagogy is teacher centric and uh, it's it's also interesting because you might want to reflect on what teacher centrism means. If teacher centrism means that you are the knowledge base and you are only there to give knowledge like the banking model, then it can become limiting. It's also very behaviorist to some extent. You're, um, but if you're saying that the, it is teacher centric in the sense that the teacher is guiding experience to enable learners to come out, there's a slight difference over there. But overall, yes, it is led by the teacher. It is controlled by the teacher. So more teacher controlled classroom and um, it doesn't allow for too much of new ideas to come in. So it becomes very behaviorist. Yes, Jivima, you can go with one more question. Uh, the next question is by Durbadal Datta, and the question is, what is the role of linguistic landscape in reading? Linguistics, so as a discipline, you mean? Uh, when you say linguistic uh, landscape, you're talking about the discipline of linguistics, morphology, syntax, those things? I believe, yes. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so see, literacy is the practical element of uh, language education. So there has been a lot of resistance to the Chomsky and format in the literacy framework. Quite a lot of literacy people look at language in action rather than language as a more, uh, you know, a, lang a, a construct and a very uh, systematic way of structuring words, sound patterns, phonology, morphology, and so on. So if you are looking at it from the perspective of what to teach, a person who would, uh, a literacy practitioner would say, let it emerge. And perhaps school students and perhaps uh, learners of a language need not know the linguistic history of a language or grammar in itself as a formula. Instead, they can infer it and get on and if they're interested, they can specialize in it in the later stage. So there has been a resistance to Chomsky's LAD and universal grammar. An alternate that has come in in the field has been Jerome Bruner's mentalist model, which is also mentalist, mind you. It's also saying that this meaning making devices embedded in the human brain. There's something about a human being that differentiates them from say a chimpanzee. And that is the ability to make sense. That is the ability to establish what he calls causation, sequencing and contingency. The three core principles of plot and narratives. And when I see something, I'm always trying to make, try and figure out what is happening so that I can identify with it. Then I can relate to it in different ways. So the social and cultural aspects are really the predominant ones. Uh, at a more functional level to answer your question, when we are looking at literacy practices in a language classroom, I'm not sure, especially when we are looking at media content and formal learning of language, stylistics and rhetoric are indispensable. We do need to teach how language semantics and syntax work together. So not syntax in itself, but language situated within context and meaning making. So each of it has its place. Again, like I said, there are no absolute answers. So it is the context of your classroom, the specific program that one teaches. So if we are teaching a BA in linguistics, of course, linguistics is important. But if we are teaching a BA in literature or ELT or communicative language teaching, one may want to reconsider how much of depth we need to go into how much of syntax and uh, and um, linguistics one needs to impart to students for them to become better communicators. So there are no um, absolute answers to these questions. What your literacy critics would say, however, and what any language pedagogue would say is assess the program, assess the learner levels, assess the contexts where they are, and let us assess our own objectives. Why are we teaching what it is that we are teaching? What are we teaching English in a university for? 
what are we teaching english in a university to a group of technology students for is it to turn them into literates or is it to get them to navigate say the cognitive academic language proficiency elements so these are the questions that we need to start asking to be better able to understand the elements to bring into the lesson plan design the selection of materials the kinds of activities and classroom pedagogies that we may want to employ and uh, that literally in fact brings me to this second part of uh, the talk on research in language education why do we need to do research um begin our uh, ma'am there's one question that is very urgently lined up for you yeah so swati ma'am could you please go ahead with the question this is a repetitive question that we are having so yeah hari ma'am yeah yeah yes yes Thank what is the methodology what methodology is suitable for online teaching this is the question repeatedly asked and uh, there are a few of them that uh, they are uh, illiterate of this uh, online teaching so how uh, they should go about it how is should it they cope up with this situation yes. uh, is this for uh, educators or students educators okay um so uh, i will not uh, lead you into thinking i am like some expert in this frankly there is no single methodology that works one or two things we need to keep in mind uh, am i audible yes ma'am yes yeah okay yes. sorry uh, i thought there was an internet connection one is uh, fatigue online is a very real thing so at the level of uh, designing activities designing classroom uh, practices it is best to break it break things up into little chunks uh, i can give you a couple of examples of what works for me and has worked for me so far what definitely didn't work was long lectures i mean you you will definitely tune out after 15 to 20 minutes and it's a miracle if you guys are still hanging in there listening to me right now i think it's it's a lot of cognitive burden it's a lot of um, information to take and there is no breath or the reason for that is that when you're in a classroom you can actually sit for 3 hours and you won't know because it's a lot of distraction you're looking out someone's coming you're walking up you're taking a little break and you're basically in, in touch with each other on an online space it doesn't happen so literature says 7 minute videos nothing more than 7 minutes cut your videos keep it short do 7 minute videos to give the basic content and take a lot of breaks second a flipped classroom works so if your learners have access to a good internet do consider sharing resources beforehand and give them a lot of time to read it's difficult reading by them uh, by ourselves and even for those of us who have been in this discipline and who are who are educators reading for a very long time is slowly becoming difficult that habit is a dying habit and we need to be a little more sensitive at this point in time shorter chunks important bits organizers so if you're taking an essay highlight the bits that you feel are important that you want them to know and ensure make it absolutely certain that they read it and they come your classrooms can be discussion spaces uh if you're using zoom a breakout room is a good option because it allows you to give them group work what happens is it builds a community then so they are actually talking to each other they're talking to their peers this particular batch for instance has not even seen each other and it's very disorienting to be studying alone so breakout rooms and small group works that is pre planned and that's told beforehand works uh, works very well um there was one more thing that i was sort of uh, journaling activities have been found to be very useful so trying to make as much of connect as possible with students it's very helpful when it comes to online teaching and learning um you can uh, try some of these oh there was actually something else i it it just came to my mind when i was talking and i've lost that thought maybe it will come back to me at a later stage Uh, but yes basically cut down yes reading materials please do not attempt to do exactly what we all do in face to face when i started my classes i cut down my reading materials by 70 almost 
I was able to complete only one third to a small chunk of what I would have generally done in a regular class. But what that helped me do was it helped me prioritize. That was what was important. What is it that I absolutely want the students in this course to know when they leave it? If I'm teaching a course on language education, here are these six or seven readings that they should absolutely know inside out and know how to use by the end of that period. It's not quantity, it's quality. So we can spend time in depth. We can spend time in more hands on activities, but cut the content really works because it lessens the load. Uh, another as at the level of assessment, I changed my assessment patterns. So in the last semester, for instance, I did not give them an NSEM exam. My questions were analytic questions and before the semester started, I had given them the questions and I gave them the timelines. I said these are the assignments. These are the reflective answers you have to write and these are the dates in which it is due. It helped them plan their time. So when the questions are given beforehand, it's you're told it's open book and I know absolutely when you're going to copy or not. Just one Google search and turn it in will ensure of plagiarism. So giving them that opportunity and working with assignments during the class, giving multiple opportunities for them to think through assignments in the class. I discussed the assignments with them. I told them we had a first draft that was then shared amongst each other. Feedback was given in live class time and they went back and they submitted it. So it makes your life also easier as an educator because then you're at least reading something worth reading and you know what to expect. So there are a lot of planning that needs to go in if you're doing online. Do consider cutting down on the number of readings as well as the duration of your class time, giving more hands on activities graphic organizers and pointing out sections that they can read flipped classrooms where there is more engagement between peers is something that will definitely enable a much more uh, a much greater sense of community because it's like they say it's not about just learning or rote learning education is a social process and we can think and these are just some things that i tried I think there is scope for a lot of creativity for each of you to assess your classrooms, your students' backgrounds and see what works for you and come up with new ideas yourself. No one has an answer to these questions currently, but these we do share some of what we have worked on and what we haven't. And these have worked for me. So, um, so in that note, maybe I can go on to the next segment, which is research in language education, which is really what I'm just telling you, because what I did in a way was to engage with precisely this question. Here is an online class. Here is something that has gone completely uh, classes and teaching that has gone completely online. I don't know my students. How am I going to get to know them? And I went back and I reflected on my first semester of experience, made certain tweaks, changed some of my assessment patterns. I introduced a digital portfolio, for instance, and said 30 percent of your marks are going to go towards it if you are going to be writing something every week. And I gave them very clear guided prompts. Your essays or your statements should definitely talk about point number one, two, three, four, which is related to the text. So they're also doing some amount of writing, reading. I didn't make it only writing. I told them they can source videos. They can make videos if they want because I teach a course on language education. And if you want to express your thoughts as a song, please go ahead and do it. So my picture was really about so my objectives were the first thing that I made clear. What is it that I wanted in my course? And then I structured my lectures to address that objective and that is really where your next level of question of why research comes in. Now we can look at this in different ways. We can look at research for the sake of knowledge construction about something. So I'm researching a classroom as a PhD scholar. It's, it's something outside me. I'm researching a social context of learning. I'm researching pedagogy. The other kind of research, which is also equally important and in fact, absolutely important in teaching practice is researching your own experience so that you become a reflective practitioner. Understanding what is happening within the classroom. 
seeing which uh, uh, which kinds of materials worked, which didn't work. There was a recent uh, workshop, in fact, that uh, we did with uh, teachers in a from a particular state, and it was uh, so. I was conducting a session on trying to get them to understand. Uh, to, it was a read aloud session on story, and it was a fabulous failure. Because what I realized at the end of 20 minutes of a read aloud of an English story was that I did not understand my teachers. They didn't know English. All I had to do was pick up a Hindi story. It would have worked. But that was something that I had not actually thought of. And they had been a very silent audience. So I had no idea that they genuinely didn't understand English. So I then wasted another 20 minutes reading the whole story out in Hindi to them. And then they got it. But this was a huge learning for me. It was a learning that I should have done my homework better. And it changed the way I then went ahead and framed the remaining workshops to actually try and understand and also look at the responses that I was getting. Were they tuned in? Were they like totally lost? Or how do I make it more engaging for them? How do I make it a little more relevant to their contexts? And these are also research because research, like our speakers in the morning have also been saying, is really a mindset. It is a way of thinking about something. It's the questions we ask and it is the objective that we want to meet and the questions leading to those objectives that make the difference. So research does not always has, have to be this major thing that we are doing about trying to construct new thing or discover something new. It can be something as simple as looking at our own experience as practitioners and figuring out how to do it better, how to make it more relevant, how to achieve those objectives of literacies. So if I want to achieve, say, functional literacy and I give them a text like Shakespeare, is it going to work? It may work for critical literacy, but my objective is not critical literacy. I want to teach a group of Navy students how to read a manual when they're on a ship. I can't be teaching them Shakespeare and will be in Shakespeare in English, even worse. So these, this is what appropriate pedagogy means. And this is where research comes in. So when you do literature reviews, when you are reading journals, when you are reading of other case studies and other kinds of researches, what we are actually trying to do is to gather information about what people have done in different contexts, see what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And structure it accordingly, which is why this kind of in reading of our own lives, of our own experiences and of our own classrooms will enable us to decide what the appropriate research studies are. Again, there are no absolute ways. And I will also not go into too much detail into this because I understand that there are uh, talks lined up in this week touching on precisely this. I think I will merely state that when we are looking at literacy research, and when we are looking at research and language education, you do have quantitative and qualitative methods, mixed methods, multi methods. Design based research is something that is uh, very new, very emergent and a very appropriate kind of a pedagogy for both the uh, constructing teaching learning experiences within classrooms, researching classroom experience as well as materials design. And uh, a little later, I'll talk to you briefly about the kind of about one particular form of uh, research study that we conducted based on DBR that will come a little later. Action research and participatory action research are also quite relevant to teachers and to us as educators, because what both of them imply is a kind of intervention that we are making within the classroom. So if I decide to create a curriculum of my own or if I make a slightly innovative lesson plan, if I deviate from a lesson plan, how do I know whether it works or not? An action research or a participatory action research becomes a way in which I am the designer of an intervention. I go into the classroom, I try out that lesson plan, then I come back and then very honestly, I make a split in my head. I'm now a researcher and I'm going to objectively sit and think about what happened. How many students were distracted? How many students were actually engaged? How do I recognize whether they are engaged or not? Sometimes a child may be sitting very quietly, not disengaged thinking. Maybe they're staring outside, but they're actually processing information. There's another child who may be sitting there writing something, but it's completely out of, out of it, out of sync with things. 
these are certain observation skills that will enable us to document our experience and reflect on it and different kinds of literature studies that happen that are descriptive that work with case studies ethnography thick descriptions these are all in a way geared towards the process oriented method which is core to literacy studies so a lot of literacy literacy studies don't necessarily and uh, studies uh, in language teaching from the perspective of literacy don't necessarily go in for a quantitative study alone of a pre and post test or trying to see if it works or not it's it's more it's not just about numbers and statistics but understanding thoughts understanding practices understanding classroom spaces the quality of materials and the quality of engagement in those places and these um what i thought i would do is to share a couple of books and resources and some of these ideas that i have found extremely useful for my for both research as research within language as well as for my own practice so uh, one book that i would highly recommend that you can look at for your own practice at a later stage is classroom interaction by ann malama thomas so this book is basically about classroom interaction and different ways of reading behavior within classrooms so there are a lot of uh, codes that are given within the book about how to understand and interpret behavior the codes have descriptions that say when they say accept feeling what does it look like how do, uh, when they say pupil talk as a response what does it look like and what do you do with it so if you look at this so if we take the example of the flanders interaction analysis categories for instance the first seven are behaviors associated with the teacher so is the teacher accepting feelings is she praising or encouraging them is she accepting or using the ideas of pupils as a dialogic process is she asking questions is she giving lectures is she giving directions so giving directions is more like take out your textbook open to page 34 underline the following words would be giving directions is she criticizing or justifying her authority or saying that no this is wrong i am the right person so as i think uh, was it farida or someone who just asked this kind of be, um, behavior would lead to a teacher centric classroom a more didactic pedagogy uh, what is the nature of pupil talk are they initiating any discussions are they responding to a question is there silence or confusion this is a kind of a three categories that uh, flanders defined and identified as part of students own um, behavior and students interaction as a way of understanding classroom pedagogies when you what generally happens in these cases is that uh, you have a class either a videographing of a classroom or you are taking notes there is someone who is writing these down and then you interpret every action and assign a code to it and then when you count the number of codes you get a sense of how high in a graph a particular action comes and that gives you a certain um, a certain idea of whether the classroom is teacher centric or dialogic or a didactic or authentic does it allow for more creativity is it more memory based is it moving towards the higher uh, higher order skills of the bloom's taxonomy and so on so um moskovich foreign language interaction um took flanders is interaction categories and added a few elements to it so when we say 8a 8a b and uh, so on what we are actually saying is in pupil talk initiation he added sub category saying 8 is specific 8a is choral so when students speak are they speaking in a chorus as in choral reading or choral response when they are reading orally are they writing or are they reading how is the response coming and so on so these were sort of worked on to make it relevant to a wider context the uh, the other category that i have found useful in my own practice and reflecting on my own uh, classroom behavior itself is bowers category of verbal behavior so where uh, he it's actually easier it's a little more contained so easier to code and even hold in your head when you are actually doing your coding otherwise here there are just lists that go on and on uh, when he talks of responding who is responding is it the teacher or is it the student so you you can make sub categories over there 
he has a category called associating. So are the students talking to each other? Are they being nice to each other? What kinds of, uh, is it related to the curriculum or not? Organizing, directing, presenting, evaluating, eliciting. So these are all categories that work with teacher's behavior. But through these categories, you can also get an insight into classroom practices and classroom processes. And that classroom process can in turn inform both original knowledge about a particular kind of classroom as well as one's own practice. If we are the teacher and we're evaluating ourselves according to these categories, these research codes, how do we fare and how can we then perhaps if we want to uh, to increase our classroom um, score from being a teacher led to say a more di uh, dialogic authentic pedagogy, then how can we say organize? How can we uh, direct and give directions to students to enable them to come up with answers? So you can play around with these in to, to see what happens within the classroom space itself. Um, Mitchell and Parkinson's categories again are an interesting set of codes to look at the concept of critical literacy simply because if you look at uh, points uh, one, which is civilization and points three, four, five and six, they're talking about course. They are also talking about other, which means it's going beyond the syllabus. So it will help you to figure out how much percentage of time is actually spent doing uh, language activities that's related to the course, but with new content, taking it beyond. So some of these uh, and Thomas and Malama Thomas has a lot more codes in. Uh, there's another one called Colt. But if you are able to see the book and actually see, read it and get access to it, it's a wonderful resource to have in your kitty to go ahead with your own uh, journey as researchers and educators simultaneously. Uh, another work, and this of course is more geared towards uh, self research. So, self research in the sense if I'm researching for myself as a researcher, I want to do a PhD, I want to do like a, write a research paper, I want to go and do some actual field action or study some classroom. These kinds or this book, Doing Second Language Research, is highly useful. These are also very process oriented research studies and research books. So they tell you how to construct research studies, how to gather data and the kinds of evidence and primary data you can get when you're doing research in language education and literacy. So you can definitely look at student artifacts. A student had has you've given a question and students have given responses to it. That becomes your original content. And based on that, you can analyze to, to derive your own conclusions about whatever it is that your research question is. Interviews, CROs, classroom observations. So classroom observations, in fact, can be coded according to these categories. But the CRO also will enable you to get a sense of the dynamics of that space, the organization, where, which direction is the chairs pointing, where is the teacher standing, are the students facing the front, or do they have to twist and turn too much to look behind them for their peer interaction? And uh, a large part of second language research works through case studies. They are long term, they are short sample sizes, so it's not necessarily like 100 people, 200 people. You're working like two or three cross case analysis if required, but it, it, it is focused and it goes deep. And it has these different uh, methods of gathering and interpreting data like the verbal protocols. So the verbal protocol was something that I found very useful when I was developing code for some of the research that we had done uh, as part of our project. Uh, this is think aloud. So what the way it works is that you are actually asking your students to uh, to uh, to try and understand what they are thinking, the critical thinking process and whether they are able to make meaning so suppose you give them a picture and you tell them, TK, here is a picture. What sense do you make of it? And the student is thinking and saying something. You're recording their response and you're asking a few more questions and then you go back and interpret the response. So these are all certain kinds of um, research methods that are highly useful both to actually conduct research studies as well as to understand your own classroom context for yourself so that we can sort of innovate and figure out how to make our own teaching better. So that's one way in which teachers and faculty become 
reflective practitioners where action research is a part of everyday thinking process and we are nuancing our thoughts to be able to interpret our classrooms in a more objective way for the specific goals that we decide to meet. Um, again, perhaps a couple of questions before I demonstrate how it worked out with a case study. Uh, if there are any questions, perhaps maybe two or three or uh, any uh, thoughts, comments, reflections. Yes, we have uh, two participants who are willing to ask a question. Dr. Monica John. Uh, Ma'am, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. And also Snehal Patil. You can also unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, mm -hmm. OK, I would probably allow Professor Chaudhary then. Uh, so you can unmute yourself and ask the question. How do we make uh, teaching more practical oriented in this online learning? Practical oriented. And application oriented because as you know, during online learning, we might be not able to demonstrate an experiment or we uh, because it um, it that interest. How can we inculcate an interest in a learner with respect to practical and application oriented concept when we are teaching them? OK, um, so for language uh, education, I think uh, one thing that I realized worked for me again was uh, the reflective journaling and a digital portfolio. So I'm, I'm actually not sure uh, uh, if there is a specific example of a practical um, oriented classroom that uh, Professor Chaudhary wants, uh, wants to ask, but uh, maybe if it, we can explain that and I'll just sort of give an idea of how to work the other practice based uh, one. So for the language uh, groups and for the reading uh, courses that I was doing, I asked, I told them that there's a 30% weightage in which I want them to write independently. And it has to happen over a week. So they get into the into the reading and writing habit. So my objective for my course was not just about analyzing discourses through texts of different kinds and essays, but also that they start producing interpretations as well as content of their own. And uh, it required some amount of hand holding. It required quite a lot of feedback, but this uh, portfolio and writing and maintaining a digital diary. A digital diary is nothing but a word document which has a date and time on it. That's all. So I told them open a word doc, keep this as an assignment and uh, you don't have to put your name on it because anyway, when they sort of upload on Moodle, I know who has uploaded it. So it can be anonymous, but for it is graded. So um, they have to put their the date, the time, and they have to write at least 50 words. They can write more if they want, but it has to be 50 words and at least, and it needs to relate to the specific topic we are discussing. So the course that I had, uh, we were looking at gender, we were looking at environment, and we were looking at the concept of the nation. So they were free to choose any text, any movie they had seen, if. They have uh, if they want to comment on a current affair, if they have had uh, an experience with their friends on any of this topic, they are free to write about it, but it needs to be coherent. It has to make sense and it has to be related very specifically to the theme that we are talking about. And uh, it took a little time for a breakthrough to happen, but it did happen because somewhere towards the middle of the course of the semester, they got into the mode of writing. So one of my students actually wrote about a gossip she had with her mother about a cousin who broke her engagement. And it was a beautiful conversation about what women should be and whose fault it is and so on. And just like, you know, I'm just struck by the way girls are blamed all the time. And there is this whole, uh, this this entire uh, um, responsibility of seeing it through only for girls and not for boys. So that uh, the practice based uh, 
comes when they suddenly realize that what they are doing in the class does have a relevance in their real life. And that connection and giving them a space and legitimizing it by giving it a grade helps. Of course, you will need to think it through because this will have to be uh, adapted to the specific kind of objectives of your language curriculum and your language program. But if there is a space for reflective journaling, we are also uh, considering, for instance, uh, trying to think of alternate ways of submitting reports for our field attachment courses uh, at, um, at our center right now, because we realize that the students have to do both a field attachment report as well as a research dissertation as part of MA and it becomes a lot for them. But we want them to think. So we thought, OK, why not turn it into a reflective journal? So so they go to these organizations, they're interning there, they see something interesting, they're coming back, they choose and they're doing all these papers related to education practice, social theories, whatever it is, pedagogy. They write their experience and they reflect on it. And we will consider the quality, depth and insight that comes into it. So if there is a certain um, alternate new ways of thinking about the study that they are doing and giving the freedom for them to bring their experience into the classroom, particularly in this environment where they do not uh, inhabit a shared space. There is no shared classroom. Everyone comes from a completely different background. They are working in their respective homes. There is no sense of a community in their heads. If we are able to give space and legitimize those realities in the assessment patterns itself, it will probably it might just work. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, that would be uh, that's a reasonable answer to your question. But. Um... Thank you so much, ma'am. I guess some part of uh, of it I have understood from the answer and I got the answer to my question. So thank you so much for it. All right. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I can't see any of you. I just see my slides sitting over there. I wish there was a face to go with the voices. Um, yeah, so I'm also mindful of the time. It's 3.30 and you're all probably really tired. So perhaps should I go ahead and wrap this up and then we can take questions towards the end? Will that be fine or is there something else we can discuss now? I'll be happy to. Whatever uh, works for everyone. Yes, ma'am, I think we can go ahead. We have comments pouring in for you. <laughs> OK, then just note them down. I'll wrap this up really quickly and then we'll take those up. I, I can then switch off my screen share. Yes, so, it's, it's uh, just compliments that uh, the participants are giving and thanking you for the wonderful <laughs> session. But yes, we can definitely go ahead. Yeah, all right. Uh, thank you. So I think this is the, I'll keep this pretty uh, short then. Uh, this is really like a, a short story of what we did at our center a couple of years ago. No? couple of years, actually five years ago, we had this large scale study called uh, the Connected Learning Initiative, Clicks, and uh, we I was part of a team that developed uh, English modules for students in um, in grades eight and nine across four states. So when we started thinking about this, we had multiple brainstorming sessions and we were wondering what it is that we wanted to do. So there was on the one hand this um, larger project mandate that we work with underserved communities. We work with school education and government schools and uh, based on multiple field visits and uh, within the language education space as a team, we realized that in the school curriculum, reading and writing has a lot of space simply because it's easier to test and you have a written exam and you have like uh, you, you, you're reading and you're writing and you can you, there's something more uh, legitimate that is given within the education formal education system listening and speaking on the other hand which is actually critical for uh, a job market for communication skills it's fundamental to being able to communicate fluently does not have so much space it also doesn't have uh, enough resources available in that particular uh, environment to be able to promote it to happen so as a group, we went back to that question of what literacy means, what language education should be, and what it is that this particular profile of students across four extremely diverse states in the country need, and how can we enable that need to be met in some small capacity. So we decided to develop these modules on uh, 
communicative English for students of grades eight to nine across four states in India, that's Mizoram, Telangana, Rajasthan, and Chhattisgarh, in um, using stories, using an integrated approach to reading, writing, listening, and speaking, which is what literature is saying primarily as the best way, because we don't say that, wait, I'm going to write now and I do only writing. I'm generally reading, writing, listening, and speaking simultaneously of some way. There is a combination of skills that happen. So teaching and learning should also occur in a similarly seamless manner rather than structure, like uh, breaking them up into four discrete entities. So we made several decisions at a pedagogic as well as content level for enabling that meaning making and construction of knowledge to occur in meaningful ways. What we came up with was really this um, um, module of 40 hours, which was based on a server based ICD platform. So we were looking at using technology to promote learning. And one of the things that call does is it says that a computer assisted language learning or a te te uh, technology enabled language learning platform gives opportunities for students to listen and speak to language, or write, read, individualized feedback, greater chance for practice and expression. So we dipped on that element. We also realized, however, that these specific schools did not have electricity around the clock and Internet is like a dream, if at all. It's never de definitely not a reality. So we decided to take it offline. We also initially thought we would develop these modules for individuals, but we realized that a lot of uh, students and parents don't have access to devices. So the only place where they do definitely have access to some kind of technology is the school space. So a lot of decisions, design decisions, implementation decisions, pedagogy decisions and content decisions came together when we thought through the process of what literacy means and what we want to give the students. We wanted constructivist pedagogies. We wanted students to produce content and not just listen to it. But we also knew by the Krashenian, uh, Stephen Krashen's input hypothesis that there has to be comprehensible input. It has there has to be an immersive technique for these spaces where English is not in their environment and technology allows a space to do that. So we built our modules around stories. Stories that were written by the team by us audio, uh, audio recorded by us made into movies put onto platforms with a string of exercises mapped to a function notion purpose and we chose particularly the function notion approach to language teaching because we were looking at communicative English. So we decided that this is what for a job market is appropriate for this group of students. But now with a function notion, how do we enable critical thinking? So then we said, OK, let's bring stories in and we use the stories as a trigger for them to think about different kinds of applications. How do they introduce themselves? How do they say hello? How do they say goodbye? How do they thank? How do they agree to disagree and so on? And uh, the minute we brought multimedia, our reading, writing, listening and speaking immediately got integrated because in our video tools, when the story comes, we have a subtitle, we have an audio and they are actually reading and they're listening to the audio. So there's like a same language uh, subtitling the bridge coterie uh, method that was uh, uh, that th that was proposed as a good method for for SLS, same language subtitling as a reading strategy. So we dipped into a lot of language learning theories to put these modules together. Uh, what I'll do is uh, are you able to see this screen? Yes, 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 yes. OK, so you are able to see the. Uh, so this is something that we first started by developing. This is called an IC map and innovation configuration map. And uh, what we did in this map is we first looked at what is available. The implementation process was the first component. And uh, then the second was on task completion. The third was on safe learning spaces. And the fourth was on language outcomes. And uh, based on... Yes. Ma'am, I think uh, you're, you're not presenting that screen, uh, the map, but the presentation itself. So I think you will need to change the... Oh, 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 oh. Okay, uh, just a second. Mm, I'm sorry. Let me just.
Okay, is this visible now? Can you see an Excel sheet? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it now is. We... Okay, yes, all right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is um, in a way what uh, what we're what I'm trying to show you is just a glimpse of the extent of a research that went into the development of modules, the implementation, and deciding what works, what doesn't work. So this is uh, a kind of a map that was developed over a period of nearly three years with multiple field visits of studying the different laboratories and uh, the different labs that we have, the different kinds of practices that are there, what teachers do, what teachers don't do. And uh, based on this, we had, for instance, these kinds of categories and visualizations. So we have three uh, sort of um, variations. The first variation is the ideal situation. The second is medium and the third is undesirable. So if you look at the category of teacher, what is undesirable is missing in action. We want the teacher in that lab. We cannot have a lab without a teacher because we also realize that unlike um, your uh, theoretical perspectives about independent learning and autonomy, a teacher is a requisite in any classroom. You cannot teacher proof a classroom with technology. It is the teacher who knows how to use technology in meaningful ways. And we saw umpteen instances across our years of field visit to realize that we don't want this. What we want, however, is the things that the teacher can do, uh, can do in the class. So she can introduce the module to students. She can ins instruct them on what to expect and how to work with them. She can tell them that she will be available whenever she is. So she, we almost scripted that ideal teacher role. And then we went in and based on these, we uh, we sort of built a larger research question. So um, I will come back to this at a later stage for now. Uh, maybe I'll just go back to my uh, slides and take that ahead. Give me a minute. Sorry about this. Yeah, so this innovation configuration map basically grew out of our understanding, our theories, our uh, reading discussions, as well as field visits to say that this is the ideal case scenario in which we want our modules to work. Now, based on this, we did a learning gains study of, of around 100 students across, uh, no, actually not 100, I think there were 200 across six intervention and six non-intervention schools in Mizoram. And the specific question that we were investigating was, what is the nature of change that comes about when we are doing listening and speaking skills in a, in, in a particular module that is process oriented? So when we constructed the module, we were focusing on enabling students to learn the process of using a language and not just language as a product. So it's not a, a num 20 new words that they learn at the end, but how do they use whatever words they know to make something meaningful out of it? So we have a story building tool built onto the platform. We have an audio recording tool. So there are questions that they do when they record their audio, they role play, they do their own podcasts, they do all kinds of things. Some of them sing songs on it. And these are different ways in which we created that atmosphere in the lab where we enable them to just keep using the language. And the research study was specifically designed as an experimental, a quasi-experimental design. But just because it's quantitative does not mean we didn't bring in a qualitative. So we uh, deliberately brought in mixed methods. We looked at pre and post tests. We had classroom observations and we had equal number of students across the schools selected um, randomly. There was an orientation that was done to the teachers to explain and get their buy-in in the first place because we needed them according to the IC map to not be missing in action, but actually conduct the lab to make a more meaningful uh, experience for the students. So in the process of doing this, we uh, had 10 questions on a 1-0 score. We had eight questions uh, for speaking tool, which we scored along spontaneity, accuracy, fluency, adequacy, and relevance. This again, the coding and the specific tools and the specific development of questions dipped directly into our objectives, the theories of language learning and our philosophy of literacy. So we wanted these questions to be informed by those philosophies and the epistemies because that is when we will know 
whether a particular module works or not. We also had a classroom observation tool where we marked out different uh, the location and there was structured free write. So we were actually writing detailed journals of what was happening and um, and how students were behaving. And based on the ICT map, we developed a series of codes. So I will show you the codes uh, maybe once the presentation is done to just show how these uh, how these codes actually map to the Bowers criteria what we had just discussed earlier. So what we were what uh, one of the reasons why I just want to sort of show you. So this is what a typical um, uh, coding of our classroom observation looked like. This uh, left column is the transcript. So we had research interns and our own field mates who were there noting down observations. So you can see, for instance, that there is a timestamp. It's 12, 2 11 p.m. When they clicked on story time, many students were unable to hear the audio. They tried to fix the connections and Lavanya asked them to connect headphones. Then they connected through one phone. They confirmed that they can hear. Now we take chunks of this and we coded it. So the PCT is peer collaboration for technology. The TMAC is there's a technology issue with machines. Then at 2.13 p.m., the teacher gives instructions. So two minutes into students settling down, the teacher comes in and she's saying login quatra wu, whatever. That's, that's like miso. So we are seeing that she's using the mother tongue in giving instructions. We see that she they have not struggled. They're, she's actually giving whole class instructions. And the peer uh, peers are collaborating in trying to um, uh, in trying to get the technology going. There is one particular thing which says that there is commotion among students, some blankly staring at the screen before them, not knowing how to log in. Now, this is where the IN minus comes in. IN minus was initiative. And here they are not taking the initiative. If they had done something or they were asking someone else, we would have scored it as IN plus, which is students taking an initiative and trying to understand how to move ahead. But here, since they are not, We've coded it as saying they're not really doing something, just staring blankly. And similarly, we coded these observations and finally went back to looking at it and seeing what picture it showed. And it was interesting to see that um, towards the end of the six weeks of our engagement, we had students moving from negative uh, or rather initiative, not taking the initiative in the initial weeks to a phase where they have actually started troubleshooting by the time the final week of uh, the, the final week of the present uh, of the intervention happened they were walking in there was one school leader who would come and help other students out they were doing their own work and this was an interesting kind of an observation simply because it was a huge learning for us we realized that there were a lot of things we could do. There were a lot of instructions we could give to teachers. There was a lot of learning that we could do for ourselves. Another learning for me, for instance, was to talk about autonomy at the school level needs a lot of support and uh, it is perhaps not required or not may not work. And it was also interesting for me to realize this because I was also simultaneously reading emerging literature on autonomous learning practices, which said that autonomy is better experienced in adult learners than in school students. So a lot of times what uh, I guess what um, we really realized is that research, teaching, understanding the field and informing ourselves as Educators were growing all the time are not mutually exclusive categories. It happens round. And if we are a researcher of any form, as well as language educators working for our students within the classroom for a particular purpose of literacy, we need to have these skills. And it is over a period of time, these skills very much become a part of our discourse and it directly informs the way we engage in the classroom for those larger purposes of cultural literacies. Uh, I think I will stop here and maybe take a few questions if that's OK. Mindful that we have only around 14 minutes left. So thank you all for that patient hearing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Dr. Swati, whatever you thought of. Rajesh, sir, you can go ahead with the questions. You need help? Julie, yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes. If, if you all have questions, please uh, write down your questions in the chat box. There are already a few questions which we need to take. Rajesh, sir, you can go through them. 
ओके मैडम स्वर्ण डायना करेडी हैज आस्ट कुड यू प्लीज सजेस्ट सम मेथड्स फॉर रिसर्च इन लिटरेचर ओके व्हाट काइंड सो टेक्सचुअल एनालिसिस इज लाइक वन ऑफ द मोस्ट ऑब्वियस लिटरेचर लिटरेरी रिसर्च मेथड्स बट इट वुड आल्सो डिपेंड ऑन व्हाट इट इज दैट यू वांट टू रिसर्च सो आर यू फॉर इंस्टेंस स्टडीइंग द बॉडी ऑफ वर्क ऑफ एन ऑथर or are you studying or do you want to investigate a theme like conflict or nation or environment or or climate change through literary texts or are you perhaps trying to do a comparative study of one theme by people from different areas are you perhaps trying to investigate a um, philosophical issue of what literary criticism is and what theory means so a large part of um, theoretical a uh, methodological uh, research would really depend on the kind of research and the kind of topic you want to investigate uh, i will also say that in the current state of the new humanities where everything has become interdisciplinary and uh, in fact i was just reading a couple of days ago that currently it's the essay form that is seen as the dominant form of writing in the 21st century just like poetry was a dominant form in the renaissance and uh, you had uh, the the ni- the 19th century was dominated by the novel the 20th century is dominated by the essay form and if you just simply take the different ways in which the essay is flourishing today it's form from graphic novels to travel writing to whatever that's a huge amount of work itself so it really depends on the theme the question and the kind of um, investigation that you want to do and this investigation will automatically inform your research methodology so if you're doing maybe a a body of work or just understanding and trying to understand what a writer is like maybe studying the body of work of someone like ambai or volga then you may have to do interviews with the authors you may have to look for original materials written by them you will have you will definitely have to look at the entire body of work and source out themes and look at argumentations um so it it will have to vary with what it is that you like to do one thing that you can uh, maybe one book that you can look at is uh, gabriel griffith's research in english studies it gives you about seven or eight very different kinds of methodologies that is currently uh, present in english studies and that will also give you an idea of the kinds of research that's being done so okay uh, another question has come from uh, durbadal datta what method is to be adopted for quantitative analysis and comparison of two groups control group and experimental group uh so for quantitative i'm i'm not too much of a statistic person myself but i can give you an overall sense when it comes to language learning and when you're doing a comparison between two groups a control and an experiment please ensure that the two groups are absolutely comparable in all quarters except one because suppose you have if you you can't compare apples and oranges you have to ensure that you're comparing green apples and white and red apples if you have too many variables you will not be able to establish an argument at the end because you will not be able to say what it is that created a change in learning outcomes or learning behavior or whatever um w- the kind of quantitative study that we did was a pre and a post test so we wanted to see whether after when we did a pre test b- uh, with all the students uh, across the intervention and non intervention schools before uh, the test questions were exactly the same and this happened before the um, the the intervention was started we recorded it after the intervention we went back and gave them the same questions we did not increase the levels the exactly the same questions that were administered in the pre test was also administered in the post test because that is when you will be able to see the gain how do they respond to the same question before and after and the questions we had framed were also process based questions so we did not ask them for memory based answer we were asking them things like what is your name where do you live what did you see on your way to school uh, that people are cutting trees around you do you agree with it do you think it's good so they were qualitative responses but it was the same question the same level 
to the same set of students before and after. The only difference was the intervention. So uh, you will need to, we had some trouble sort of, uh, in fact, justifying or other, um, uh, there was a slight variation in our design because what was also happening is ideally when you're doing a pre and a post test and uh, with a control and an experiment, the schools should also be the same. So you may take one school and you have one group of students in the eighth grade who are being uh, used as a control group and another that is used as an experimental. We deliberately didn't do that because this was also a project rollout mandate. We cannot uh, withhold the modules to a set of students for the sake of research. So we took an, a categorical decision at that stage that for us, the students having access to the clicks English module was more important than a research outcome. So we will try and compromise this and try and find schools that are comparable. But uh, we didn't want to withhold the modules from students in the same school for any duration of time. But ideal, an ideal kind of an experimental setup would be the same environment, same teacher, same locality, same class, same resources, same textbooks. One has something, the other doesn't. So ensure that that context and the amount of variables around you are exactly the same and there is one categorical difference so it's easier to pinpoint what could have led to that difference and uh, this is and the other thing again an important point that i also learned in the process of this study is when we are making uh, research questions and when we are designing uh, questionnaires uh, especially tests for uh, for an experiment we tend to think TK, they've done six months level thoda zyada karte hai. They will struggle there. So if you want to see a difference in variations, the levels of questions for a research has to be the same in the pre and the post. So we use the same tools in both cases, and then we were able to see the, the variations there. Um, I hope that. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question uh, related to the uh, variables that you just spoke about. Mm -hmm. So how important uh, do you think is the pace or the frequency of uh, 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 of meetings? So for example, how often um, the class is conducted? Should that also be one of the variables or that can vary? So for example, like uh, for example, when you mentioned that you conducted the research in two schools, so it could be like, you know, at one place they are meeting like thrice a week, whereas at other they might meet like once a week. And also the time factor plays an important role. So how do you think that would impact or affect the outcome? Uh, that's actually a very good question. That was in fact also something that was beyond our control because we could not uh, go into a government school and tell them you're going to spend the next two hours doing just this. They have their own routines. They have their own dynamics. Um, the other reason why we also encountered and struggled with this element was because in language learning, there is actually no concrete evidence of how long or how du how intense a duration of immersion should be. Simply because lifelong learning is, a, I mean, language learning is a lifelong learning process. I will only always keep getting better. And there is no set period to say that uh, do it for two weeks and you're going to be an excellent communicator. It doesn't work. The other variable is some people naturally pick up languages. Others have like I am terrible at learning languages. I just can't. It is just not in me. It's a huge struggle, but that, that doesn't mean I'm foolish. It's just that I just can't do it. But there are others who pick up languages really fast. So there are too many variables and they are very individual centric. So there is never really a clear answer to this question. But yes, um, the rollouts happened at very different paces. They were timetabled and uh, we are not quite sure how or how it didn't work. So we, of course, we fortunately got positive outcomes. We're not too stressed about that. Uh, but uh, yes, there is no specific way of saying itna hi karna hai and this is the way in which it gets to be done. It, uh, it It's not in the nature of the discipline itself. So ideally, people would say if it's an immersion method, you listen to a language more and more, you use a language more and more, and you're constantly engaged with the language. And over a period of time, you get into the flow of the language. Other than that, I'm not quite sure uh, how it works, though. Ideally, it should be comparable. 
So if it's a research design, it will just save you a lot of heartburn later explaining your work away. I guess that's about the main uh, thing. But it should be more, uh, it should be comparable and everything should be very similar even at the level of frequency for you to make a concrete statement that this is how it worked and this is the reason why something happened. Um, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, we have one more question here. Um, I think this should be one of the last questions we take because we are actually running short of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a moment. I think I lost the question. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a lot of uh, comments yeah, yeah. pouring and then. Yeah, yeah um, so yeah. Uh, one of the participants yeah. has requested you to uh, mention the name of the book that we can, of course, uh, take it later as well. And there is the last question. What's meant by stylistics as far as poetry teaching is concerned? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question again? What is yeah. meant by stylistics? Yeah, what is stylistics when as far as poetry teaching is concerned? Stylistics would uh, for poetry uh, when you're teaching poetry you're primarily looking at uh, rhythm, rhyme, rhythm, meter and imagery. So quite a lot of symbolism and imagery is what makes poetic works what they are. They are rich and dense. Again, it would depend on the kinds of poetry that you're looking at. Are you looking at verse poetry? Are you looking at epic no poetry, short ones, long ones? So uh, look, stylistics will... Uh, focus on the specific uh, use of metaphors, imagery, symbolism. You can look at uh, Richard Bradford's book on stylistics. It actually has entire sections on uh, poetry, poetry teaching, analyzing, writing poetry itself in that sense. So the use of language is also important. Rhyme and rhythm, scheme, metrics, the so stress, unstress, where, how far, uh, how long a line goes, how short it goes, use of punctuation, so a lot of it is construction of language and uh, yeah, I think I, I have a feeling I have misinterpreted that question somehow. Is that what you wanted to know or? <laughs> okay, ma'am. We have another question for you. This is from uh, Prakash Reddy, Koreddy. Mm -hmm. So his question is, are you able to hear me, ma'am? Yes. Okay, the question is, my question is, what extent critical literacy effect on cultural literacy? My question is, what extent critical literacy effect cultural literacy? Yeah, have effect on cultural literacy? Give an example of it, ma'am. So, um, I would say that critical, critical literacy to some extent is a subset of cultural literacy because culture is really that larger rubric. And when you're talking about discourses and power and the self and the other, they are embedded within cultural practices. There is no consensus on this. People do debate it. They look at it. Some people look at it as two separate categories altogether. E.D. Hirsch's concept of cultural literacy, for instance, is very different from, say, someone like uh, Pope and Kalansis who would see cultural literacy as part of multiple examples. So I would go back to that meme itself as an example in a way. If if you're looking at that uh, that little uh, comic strip of the woman complaining about her husband, there is a lot of culture embedded in it. It is considered yes. in, in the case of an Indian society, of course the woman goes into the kitchen and cooks, no man is going to do that. It starts from there and then it goes on to the irritability of the whole thing, the, power, the fact that there is a power dynamics and most importantly, there's an ideological state apparatus and there's a hegemony. We have internalized it. I don't think any of us is actually going to say, ha, TK, fine, you won't know how to cook, I do it anyway. Why the hell can't a 35 year old man cook for himself? But a 35 year old woman was also a child somewhere, right? Kisi ki to beti thi. And we learned, right? We learned once we got married. The, that is cultural, but that's also critical. And this it, these are like subsets of two different kinds. Exactly. And exactly. so sep uh, the I think the only reason why it gets separated over there is because when we are looking at certain functional language classrooms like teaching word, vocabulary, grammar, then understanding that words are associated with cultures and trying to teach a cultural connotation of a word like say a Mangal Sutra to a 
a Westerner who has never seen a chain before or the meaning of a wedding band to a culture where they just see it as a ring are embedded in certain beliefs. It's not necessarily always a power politics thing. So part of it also, and Hirsch's own concept of cultural literacy comes from the context of SAT scores where you have these exams and gates and SAT, where you're learning a list of word and meanings just to clear that exam to tell Americans that I know the language. But it is, there is a lot. So he was very critical of that. In fact, that is where his entire book on cultural literacy came about. It's like, what the hell are we teaching our students? Why are we teaching them the dictionary? Why can't we teach them to use the language? Why can't we teach them to be responsible citizens? What it means to be racially sensitive, what it means to uh, to look at other people around us in a more humanistic way. So it it comes out of a lot of these ideological packages. And uh, again, it's it's like one within the other. Ma'am, in that case, doesn't it overlap with other subjects? Like supposing we're teaching Absolutely. about if it be teaching about citizenship or identity crisis or identity or uh, whatever the other points we discuss, aren't we bordering on to the domain of other subjects? Like what will sociology do or what will political science do then? So right. it becomes interdisciplinary and we do not have a unique exclusive stand for that particular subject that is language. So if we have to teach English, we have to teach English. Perhaps we can have a little choice on that, but then if I am to teach in an English class, what is citizenship or what is it to have your own identity? Aren't I, uh, aren't I bordering on some other subjects thereby create a chaotic situation? It will not create a chaotic situation. In fact, that is the whole point of the new humanities. That's the whole point of something like an IB curriculum. So if you look at a lot of work that is currently being done, people are that's also, in fact, some way uh, the, the the whole vision of the new education policy right now. It's trying to say that we have compartmentalized things in the heads. It's trying to say that keeping STEM apart from humanities is a crime. If, how can if, if I'm talking about climate change, I need to read climate change from multiple perspectives. I need to read it from a geological perspective. I need to read it from the perspective of economics, from the perspective of literature, from the perspective of sociology, from the perspective of history, from, I mean, just basically the geographical perspective. There are so many things that get onto it. And this, in fact, also reminds me of something that Professor Agni Hotri had said at one point, when we were having discussions on what language education means and this whole idea of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity came in and he was like, you know, literature gets written in a language. You don't have literature separate and language floating separately. Literature, stories, history, the constitution of India is also written in a language. It's the English language or whatever other language it is. So when you are actually reading, you're reading a content and in the process of engaging critically with the content, your natural language skills develop. So the emphasis is not on saying I'm going to teach you the grammar as much as saying, let's try and understand what the content is saying. And in the process of getting engaged with discussions and meaningful arguments about the world around us and our place in the world, the language development happens almost subconsciously. So yes, there is some amount of uh, mentoring that would be needed. We may want to go back and enable some activities to give that basic vocabulary control so the meaning making happens. But the focus of the classroom engagement really becomes theme based and content based. And in the process of content based learning, we are imbibing that specific language. It allows you, for instance, to perhaps come into the language, uh, into the classroom with your own mother tongue and express yourself. And you are then producing an original idea which is valued. And then what the teacher is probably doing is trying to show how you can express that original value in a different language. So the pedagogies still require quite a lot of research in the Indian context. It's uh, there has hardly been much research on the nature of multilinguality for the simple reason that even a three language formula only takes into account the official languages. As Professor Agnihotri would say, there are 1652 dialects and a few and many more 
that have not even been accounted for. So when you focus on only those 22 languages, you are still doing disservice to a whole group of students who don't share those languages. So how do, so maybe one way would be to think of these global citizenship spaces, to think about critical peace, to think about gender equity as one of the many things you're doing, not the only thing. Of course, everything has its place, but through these kinds of discussions, you're bringing indigenous knowledges into the classroom and you're engaging with a more dynamic living space. And your language is seen as a cognitive tool. It's something to help you make sense of experience, make sense of other people's experience. So we become more empathetic and tolerant. We don't close off possibilities. So uh, there is, um, there's in fact this book by uh, Rita Verma who talks about critical peace literacy. And she documents these different case studies about how peace studies is also a literacy. You're, you're kind of entering into the knowledge of what it means to live in a peace in a world peacefully and critically engaging with the issues around inequity, around violence, terrorism, of, of discrimination to bring about more equitable spaces. GCE is also doing a lot of work on literacy. So language education is in fact that pan cutting across of categories. Because when you think of the CALP, the BICS versus the CALP, basic interpersonal communication skills versus cognitive academic language proficiency, that's also a language that we are engaging with. So the activities can then um, help students think of a more equitable society. New humanities is precisely this, in fact, that it has brought in a lot of economics, sociology, anthropology, different kinds of, I mean, essays on cancer, for instance, oncology is a part of your reading group because medical health and, and disease is a part of human experience. So if I'm a human being, I need to talk about everything I experience and I experience everything. So why leave those experiences out? Thank you, thank you. Yeah, shall we in conclude the session, uh, Swati ma'am? We're spilling over. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Prajesh sir, you can Wonderful go Wonderful session, ma'am. Amazing command over the language, ma'am. Salute to you. Prajesh sir. The se session, yes. I absolutely agree with you all that the session has been interactive, enriching, and loaded with information and so many more adjectives coming in the uh, chat box we all have seen. We just stand more informed and learned after having attended Madam Nishivita's session on language teaching and research in education. Madam, we are highly indebted for this wonderful and engaging presentation. And I thank all the respected dignitaries, the participants, our respected HOI ma'am, and all the faculty members for being there constantly throughout the session. Thank you so much to one and all present here. Thank you so much. With this, we come to the end of the session. Thank you all the eminent speakers of the day. Special thanks to you, ma'am. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure all will agree with me that we have had a very enriching program yeah. listening to around more of, more than four hours of talk. I thank all my participants for a patient listening and I hope you have stand benefited and profited. We meet tomorrow again uh, at 10 o'clock with the equally prolific and eminent speakers. We wish, we hope, and we pray that you join us tomorrow at 10 o'clock. In case you have any queries, please put it in the WhatsApp chat. We will try to attend as many as possible. Meanwhile, fill up your feedback forms. That is mandatory. And once again, thanking our speaker, thanking all those who have initiated, and initiated a very good participation. Thank you. Stay blessed. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, just uh, one uh, correction over here in the announcement.
announcement, uh, Susan, ma'am. Uh, we are not sending feedback form today. We'll be sending some task. It will be an uh, it will be MCQ test of 10 marks. You all have to uh, those who have participated, they have to uh, write this MCQ. And uh, every day at I think in between 6 to 7 uh, p.m. will be sending you the links of this uh, link of this uh, MCQ test and you have to you will be getting 12 hours to complete this test. Feedback form will be shared at the end of uh, FDP. So 